Welcome back. I want to first tell you guys that if you are having problems getting notifications, there's two places where you can consistently see my content posted uh, ahead of time. That would be minds.com at Chef Leopard on minds.com and also my channel on BitChute, which is also called Bold Like a Leopard. And it, you can find that at Chef Leopard. So please like, share, and subscribe before we go on. Now, one of the big issues that came about last week in, you know, amid all of the crap with, uh, with Theresa May and with the declassification was this downfall of Michael Avenatti, who is still basically haunting the you know, he, he's haunted the entire Trump presidency largely as a result of the willingness of the media to latch on to people who are trying to cash in on the anti-Trump sentiment with parts of the country. This isn't to say that you should not have people on TV who are critical of Donald Trump. Of course, there are certain people I think that, you know, Judge Napolitano, I guess, is not a bad example. If you want to think about somebody on the left, I think you could certainly give some space to someone like um, Chris Hedges, for example. These are people I don't agree with, but I think that they have valid viewpoints to bring forward that we shouldn't just squelch because a lot of us happen to like Donald Trump. But Michael Avenatti was essentially this, you know, this this demon that came out of left field and started to whisper things in the ears of these media figures, and they loved what they were hearing, so they let him do it. So here's here's some of Tucker's coverage. Now, he's using part of this Washington Free Beacon uh, clip and mashup of all the praise with Avenatti. We're not going to go through all of that because it's a little too long, and I want to go through some other content that I found. In the mouth. John Meacham says he may be the savior of the republic. I owe Michael Avenatti an apology. For the last couple of weeks, I've been saying, enough already, Michael. I've seen you everywhere. What do you have left to say? I was wrong, brother. Sincere question. How? So the last commentator was Stephanie Rule from MSNBC. And what I find so funny is that Stephanie Rule appears sometimes on this radio show that I listen to in the morning. Uh, when I'm on the way to work, the Hugh Hewitt show, which which itself is not a very good show, but it happens to be on the radio while you're driving. So Stephanie Rule often is one of these people who's talking about all of the lack of dignity in the White House and how people, you know, that th this is the problem. We Our politics aren't serious enough. And yet there she is praising Michael Avenatti and and, and cheerleading him. And that's the problem when you look at these media figures who want people who have ulterior motives to succeed, when in reality, you, you do have to look at what people are telling you and verify whether what they're saying is true, even if it's something that could help you. How dumb would you have to be to find the creepy porn lawyer impressive? He was such a transparent fraud, such a total con in it only for himself. There was no question about that ever. We told him so directly the night he came to visit us on the show. Watch. You've profited from Stormy Daniels. You've done tens of millions of dollars with the free media on the basis of your relationship with her, and she's working in strip clubs. You're exploiting her, and you know that. Why aren't you paying her some of what you're making? Sir, this is absurd. But answer my question. Why are you rich and your client sir, is not... working in CD strip clubs? Sir, do you have any idea how much money I've earned? You're on case? every cable show. You You're running no for idea. president now. You have no idea. Well, I know that you haven't paid your taxes. You have... Like so many lawyers, you were taking advantage of her. And you pose as a feminist hero because you are shameless and the other channels let you get away with it. But you're an exploiter of a woman and you should be ashamed of it. Now, when I saw that the first time, I thought Tucker was a little sanctimonious, even though, like him, I did not trust uh, Michael Avenatti, but he took a bit of a risk because think about it this way. And I'm talking to my audience here um, because they know that I'm, I talk a lot about the presumption of innocence and, and, you know, certain very, very fundamental issues of 
of law and civil and civil liberties and civil rights. Michael Avenatti was alleging a number of things about Trump, uh, mainly in the civil sector, saying, well, he's effectively silencing a woman who has something to say that, that deserves to be heard in the public eye. And in many cases, people would say that his 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 uh, his agenda was driven by a desire to have the truth revealed. Now, that's me playing devil's advocate. In point of fact, I don't think that the Stormy Daniels scandal, if you can even call it a scandal, really was something that people cared about. Because the fact is that in the context of when it happened, Donald Trump was just this celebrity apprentice uh, host and whatever, and people, people are used to people like that behaving like idiots all the time. So, no, I think that Tucker did read Michael Avenatti right. He was simply taking a bit of a legal risk because, sure, you know, Avenatti, he looks like a skeevy character, but in order to be able to win a legal case, you don't always get to pick counsel that is that is uh, the, the, the most prestigious and above board. Some people, it's, it's, it's not easy to get a very powerful lawyer to take a case. It just isn't. Lawyers are very picky about who they spend their time on, and they certainly don't want to do things pro bono if they can get away with it, except for some very noble souls that are out there that, you know, they'll, they'll do these cases for people that are indigent or that they, they've suffered a, a pretty grievous injury or something. We hate to brag, almost never do, but tonight we're going to make a rare exception. We were right about him. Today, the creepy porn lawyer was indicted on a new set of criminal charges. They alleged that he defrauded, yes, Stormy Daniels. Turns out he was not a feminist hero. According to the indictment, CPL forged her signature on a letter and then used it to steal her book advance. He blew that on hotels, restaurants, and things like that. All the while, Stormy Daniels worked in strip clubs to pay her bills. The creepy porn lawyer lived luxuriously on her misfortune. Is anyone outside of cable news surprised by this? Melissa Francis, co-host. So, so yeah, I, th I think Tucker Carlson was, uh, you, you do have to hand him credit. Uh, and and uh, I'm not exactly a huge follower of Tucker Carlson. I think some of his clips are kind of funny. But, you know, it's it's annoying to have to watch a lot of these Fox News segments and whatever. Uh, just not too big of a fan. The fact is, though, that Tucker Carlson was one of the few people at the time who directly confronted Avenatti and said, L look, I mean, wh when are you going to fess up and tell us that this isn't about Stormy Daniels and her story, it's about you? And when you analyze the legal ramifications of it, there's... I mean, this guy, I, I just found his channel. The, le the reason that I'm looking at his channel instead of the Legal Eagle channel is because the guy who runs Legal Eagle doesn't have a video on this yet, and this guy does. He actually does a good job. It's a little long, so I skipped to a part in the middle where he addresses the indictment itself. That victim one had. That's the context. Let's start reading the indictment now. Overview. The charges in this indictment arise from a scheme in which Michael Avenatti, the defendant, abused the trust of, defrauded, and stole from a client, Victim 1, by diverting money owed to Victim 1 to Avenatti's control and use. After assisting Victim 1 in securing a book contract, Avenatti stole a significant portion of Victim 1's advance on that contract. He did so by, among other things, sending a fraudulent and unauthorized letter purporting to contain Victim 1's signature to Victim 1's literary agent, which instructed the agent to send payments not to Victim 1, but to a bank account controlled by Avenatti. After receiving the money into to that account, Michael Avenatti, the defendant, used it for his own purposes, including, among other things, to pay employees of his law firm and a coffee business he owned, to make payments to individuals with whom Avenatti had personal relationships, to make luxury car payments, etc., etc. So let's just state the obvious. If these allegations are true, it is extremely serious. When a lawyer... So I, I can't show you the whole video. It is a good video, though, if you just want to hear the legal issues without all of the buzz, without all the news, without the, you know, did he screw Stormy Daniels or anything. So, some sometimes you need people who are actual legal professionals to explain to you the real important issues here. But I'll skip all of that here 
and tell you what, what is the main offense that we're talking about. And this is something that I've learned from a lawyer that I know. Commingling of funds is one of the biggest no-nos in the law profession, in the legal profession. Commingling of funds essentially, it, and he goes into it in this video, it's a little long, but it means that when you, your client is supposed to receive certain monies from a different party, you have to set up an independent trust for those monies to go into because the hypothetically things could occur where you, you have to end up paying this massive fine or, or, or everything you go, you own gets confiscated because you got indicted for something similar to what's happening with Avenatti. And therefore you could not commingle funds when, when you, your, when your client receives a settlement, for example, you put it in the trust, it's safe over there. They can then have it sent to, you know, deposited in their account at a certain point and everything's all good. It is one, it's one of the basic things in law. Another issue that was broached upon in this video was that you do not forge the, sig the signature or you don't sign as, as the client. Okay, you can sign for the client or on behalf of the client, but you can't sign as the client. That is forgery. So if, if you want to really understand what Avenatti did, it's not just the stealing and it's not just the dishonesty. It's the willingness to break some of the actual, the actual rules of what being a lawyer are. So people have this conception that lawyers are in and of themselves dishonest people. And, you know, that, that, that is a topic that could be explored very, you know, very, very deeply. But even among lawyers, there are issues where people look at these things that people could do as beyond the pale. And what Avenatti is being accused of here is significantly beyond the pale. Um, other, other things that are going on. So Soledad O'Brien, who is looking awful at the moment, <laughs> she, she's a former CNN anchor, and she's claiming, this is what she says, Ex-CNN anchor Soledad O'Brien took a subtle shot at her former network on Friday, tweeting that embattled attorney Michael Avenatti was on cable news regularly because he was, quote, free and taken seriously because he is, quote, a white guy who is on a TV a lot. Here's what was learned. If you are bombastic on TV, you'll continue to be booked on shows because you are free. And that is important in the cable TV model. O'Brien tweeted in response to author Charlie Sykes pondering whether or not anything was learned from the liberal media's obsession with Michael with Avenatti. That is pretty. I mean, I don't know why Soledad O'Brien would be talking to Charlie Sykes, who's who's a, a never Trump Republican, because Soledad O'Brien is is a hardcore liberal. I may, maybe I guess, I guess there's really no. Well, okay, so she's retweeting him. So she's retweeting Charlie Sykes. Charlie Sykes is a has-been conservative uh, talk show host. And he's basically... <laughs> oh, my God. Brian Stelter. We're going to get to Brian Stelter in a second. So the real problem that we're talking about is that these idiots, they suck up so much time on the air. And then once their stories implode... The media has to explain why they initially took them so seriously and let them have any time on the air. Uh, and, and, and Charlie Sykes asked the question, did we learn anything at all from Avenatti or from the fiasco of Michael Wolf's shambolic book? We we're about to find out. So he, he published this in The Bulwark, which is, which is also another, another Never Trump trash heap, which is probably not going to go anywhere because nobody wants to be an anti-Trump conservative nowadays, it, it just doesn't pay. It's it's a losing battle. So, I'll say this. One of the reasons that Soledad O'Brien could be correct is not because white, white people are implicitly trusted by the media. I would say it's that in certain communities, the voicing of certain opinions 
sparks the antenna of the of the audience within that community and they go and glom on and attack you. This is something that I saw two or three years ago with Wendy Williams, who she she made she made this segment on her show questioning whether there's a need for historically black colleges and universities saying, well, we're living now in in uh, the post civil rights era. People have adapted to having black people in, in you know, institutions that are higher learning or, or whatever. And she was almost booed, booed off of the air. The black community and organizations went after her and said, well, we're going to force your sponsors to pull their ads from you and, and, and everything. Chevrolet had, a, they ended up pulling their sponsorship of her show. And Wendy, Wendy Williams is black. So there is a certain attitude within those communities that filters away opinions that the majority of people don't necessarily want to hear within that community. When you're talking about somebody like Avenatti or someone like Michael Wolf, the people who are consuming that are the type of audience that is closest to the people who, who run CNN and run MSNBC. People like Michael Wolf, people like Michael Avenatti are very similar to the people on MSNBC and, and CNN or at the very top. There's not much d d difference between them in terms of political opinions and in terms of background. I'm assuming that a lot of these, these uh, would-be reporters and journalists even have law degrees. So I would say that it's that Soledad O'Brien, even though she's taking this for, for, uh, from an SJW perspective, she's not that far off of the mark. Because, yeah, you, you can get onto the air and you could, you could look very professional or, or very... Uh, in, in Avenatti's case, I'd say he, he even reminds me sometimes of Mussolini. He's just very belligerent, goes in almost like a pit bull uh, anytime you see him on TV. The only time I ever saw him humbled was during that interview with Carlson, who wouldn't take any of his crap from him. Uh, the person who I think really sullied his reputation was Brian Stelter, who, who did say, well, we think that you could be a good, a good uh, presidential candidate. What he, what, he, what he says now, he says, so there was a libel sources host, then defended his previous praise for Avenatti as a 2020 contender, insisting that his argument still holds about successful presidential candidates having to be TV stars. So he says, my thesis back then, which still holds, is that all future U.S. presidents will be television stars of some sort. TV star power will be a prerequisite for the presidency, Stellar argued. That's why I told Avenatti, one reason I'm taking you seriously as a contender is because of your presence on cable news. Stelter made it clear, however, that he was not taking him seriously anymore and that he owns his comments. So that, that's... <coughs> That's a very st funny statement out of somebody like Brian Stelter, who himself is not taken seriously by anyone, uh, especially people outside of the CNN sphere. The premise that being a TV star entitles you to the to, to being taken seriously as a presidential contender is ridiculous. Uh, and and let's be honest, when but when Donald Trump was initially running, may, many people said that it was. It was a circus that he would be even participating, and and mostly he's he's known for you know his huckster deals and things like that, and for Atlantic City and The Apprentice and stuff like that. But the fact is that not all of these skills, TV TV skills and and marketing yourself on TV are transferable. You have Mark Cuban, who is always talked about as being a potential 2020 contender, and he simply doesn't throw his his head in the ring, possibly, I believe, because he doesn't think that that type of, of uh, presence on TV necessarily translates for everyone in the same way. Mark Cuban is, an, is like, he has a good position on Shark Tank, but he's not one of these people who goes on Shark Tank and makes uh, ridiculous decisions and, and tells, but like once in a while you'll hear him say something outrageous, but he's not even the most outrageous person on the show. That would be Kevin O'Brien. So I'll, I'll say that 
this this assumption that the future presidents will be TV stars is ridiculous. Uh, at a certain, I think that Donald Trump, in that respect, is a little bit of an anomaly. Uh, the other issues that that uh, brought him to the presidency, the trade deals, the border, the issues with um, you, you know the the war on terror, uh, Obamacare. Those were festering issues. It happened to be that his personality and his his belligerence, his ability to go out on the stage and, and really unapologetically advocate on, on behalf of, of uh, his positions, that was one of the reasons that people started to go after him. It's it's not just the photogeneity that, that makes you popular. It's the way that you use it. Look at Beto O'Rourke. He was on TV for literally most of 2018 trying to unseat Ted Cruz, mostly through virtue signaling and and t- telling and 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 uh, you know astroturfing and stuff like that, the, g- going on these networks and trying to quote unquote inspire people through the tube. And Beto O'Rourke lost to Ted Cruz, who's not a very charismatic politician and who's actually hated and not photogenic. He loses to him. Now he's running for president, still a telegenic guy, still uh, you know languishing in the polls. He doesn't have uh, any traction there. And he's always apologizing. So it's not just about being a television, a television star. Okay? It's, that, that's really a very secondary issue. That's about it. Uh, I think that this is still a, a very interesting story. Uh, I certainly don't think that Avenatti uh, is, is going to be someone in the future who people will look at uh, as, as being, you know, the real pivotal figure that they envisioned him when, when he was in the limelight, people are going to try to forget him. He'll be remembered sort of as this P.T. Barnum type character who misled a lot of people, and then he flew way too close to the sun, and now he's gone, and he may be going away for a long time. So if you like this video, please like it. Also, share the video. Subscribe to the channel. Comment below. You can find me on BitChute. Chef Leopard or Bold Like a Leopard. You can search either of those. It'll pop up on Minds.com at Chef Leopard. Uh, donate to me on Subscribestar at Chef Leopard. And follow me on Gab at Starscream85. And enjoy your Sunday and your Memorial Day weekend.